distinguished scientists affirm that the great majority of people living in the developed world are damn fools. We don't like that. That many fools? Damned? Well, damned is a perfectly respectable English word found in any dictionary, most prominent in the greatest book of the world, KJV version of the Bible, where it means condemned. The word gives a hint that actions have consequences. Well, why do so many scientists affirm that most people are fools? Because people don't die. They kill themselves. Most people don't die. They suicide by knife and fork or by too much sitting. I have hoped and prayed that I might be able to say something that will save many people unnecessary pain and a shortened lifespan. So I'm going to give you some vital facts which if you understand them can save you so much sorrow. Here's the first one. Only one person in ten in their forties is physically fit, which means that nine out of ten are preparing for decades of pain and sorrow and an early death. Second fact, most people foolishly prefer taste to what they feel. Now let me remind you about one in every five people has persistent or recurring chronic pain. If you're like me, you'd swim through a sewer to avoid pain. But if you prefer taste to how you feel, you are inviting pain. The third fact. There are 10,000 chemicals that can now legitimately be added to our foods. That's the law in USA. Many of these chemicals are dubious as regards health impact. The next point to make is this. Supermarkets are really mausoleums. Mausoleums of dead foods, except for the fruits and the vegetables. If you live from cans and packets and bottles, you are living on processed foods. And that's a popular way of suiciding. If you live on preserved foods, you're probably getting in most of them excessive salt, excessive fat, and some chemicals. It's best to remember the greatest rule that should guide you three times a day. Eat fresh, whole food, un uncomplicated, not refined, cheaply of vegetable origin. Now a fact that will stagger you. The greatest disease explosion the world has ever known is taking place today. Diabetes. Australia, which only has a small population, 26 million people, 100,000 people a year 
are declared diabetic. And get this, every three hours, a diabetic limb is amputated. Medical men tell us that in the next generation, wherever we go, we'll run into amputees because of diabetes. And of course, the background of diabetes is usually a bad diet, lack of exercise and heredity. When you think of these things, you may realize that Thornton Wilder, when he wrote the play, Our Town, was wanting to save our lives. Our town is about Grover's Corner in New Hampshire, and the heroine is Emily, Emily Webb. She'd been married to George Gibbs, but having her second child had died. At the grave, she's told, after 14 years in the grave, she can have one day back to review life in Grover's Corner and see her mama and papa. So she elects to do that. But when she goes back, she's horrified to find that everybody is so busy, they scarcely take time to look at each other. Mama, mama, she, plied. she cries, I'm back. Can't you see me? For a moment, we're all together. Can't we be happy? But a mother doesn't see her, and a father doesn't see her. Everybody's too busy to even look at each other. After a while, Emily cries out, I can't go on, I can't go on. Take me back, back up the hill, back to the grave. But wait, let me say goodbye. Goodbye, Grover's Corner. Goodbye, Mama and Papa. Goodbye, world. And so she goes back. And Simon Simpson says, well, I warned you. Now you know what life is like back there. They spend and waste time as though they had a million years. And every one of them is possessed by some selfish passion, hour after hour. Well, Thornton Wilder has made his point. When he gives the words that people spend and waste time as though they had a million years. You know, there are creatures that don't have mouths or stomachs. They only live one day. Compared to them, you and I have long lives. If we reach in good health, the Bible pronouncement of three score years and ten, we would have 25,000 days. But wait a minute, do we really? A third of them were asleep. Can't do much then. A third of them were working to earn a crust. Not everybody likes their job. And the sixth of our days, things that have got to be done, washing, grooming, eating, drinking. Another six of our days, social demands. You've got to go and visit so-and-so or go to this meeting or go to that. How much real time, free time, does that leave you? 1,000 days. That's not much, is it? Perhaps that's why the Bible talks about life as a vapour that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. I often think of people and then I pull up short. I realise they're dead now. And soon I'll be gone and you don't have long. Life is very brief. It's a shadow. When as a child I laughed and wept, time crept. When as a youth I walked and talked, time walked. When I became a full-grown man, time ran. When older still I grew, time flew. Soon I'll find in travelling on, time gone. 
O Christ, wilt thou have saved me then? We don't realise how brief our lifespan is. An unbeliever may say to us, don't bother me now, don't bother me ever. I want to be dead forever and ever. But Christianity, Christianity offers you a wonderful alternative. Eternity with all those you've loved and cared for. Eternity with Jesus. Eternity in a new Jerusalem. Streets of gold. Music and joy and health and no pain and no tears and no sorrow. We must be awake to life's brevity. The Bible says, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. A minister was once asked, what is life? He looked at the question for a moment, turned on his heel and walked off. The next day, the eccentric man said, why didn't you answer my question? I did, said the minister. I was with you for a moment and then I was gone. An eccentric man knocked at the door of a friend. When the door opened, he said to the friend, were you expecting me? No. Well, what if I'd been deaf? That's a good question. I remember I used to get letters from overseas that had a motto stamped on them. One short life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Not everybody believes that life can be eternal. Kerry Packer died in his 60s with cancer. He said to Philip Adams one day, you want to know what's inside me? A big black hole. He didn't believe in eternity and he didn't live for it. My dear friends, don't be like Kerry Packer. Have something worth living for, not money. He was a billionaire, so what? He had cancer. 40% of Australians and 40% of Americans or more will be proclaimed as having cancer. 40%. We need to be aware of life's brevity and do what the Bible says. Teach us to number our days. That we may apply our hearts under wisdom. The Christian has a tremendous advantage. They don't think money is everything. They don't think money is the answer to everything. In my country of Australia, people have been getting better incomes for over two score years in the 1950. But what's the result? Are they happier? No. Sociologists tell us increased wealth does not guarantee increased happiness. Money is not the answer to everything. Money is not everything. You must not serve God and mammon. Mammon's a name for wealth. So let's not be fools. Let's make our lives worthwhile. Let's eat right. Let's move. Did you know they never bury anything that moves? Some people's only exercise is pushing a trolley cart in the food market or swallowing ice cream. We were made to move. You cannot be healthy unless you are active, physically active, at least, at least one hour a day. The Christian has such a great advantage they believe the Bible is the, the, the body is the temple of God. So the Bible teaches. It's sacred. He that defiles the temple, him will God destroy. That's strong language. Your temple is a magnificent affair. It's composed of 10,000 trillion cells. And get this, and never forget it, every cell in the human body which contains 46 chromosomes, 25,000 genes, etc., etc. Every cell 
is smaller than an invisible speck of dust. It's a hundred billion times more compact than anything man can make, and yet it has 6,000 component parts, as many as in a Boeing jet airliner. Do you get it? 10,000 trillion cells, every one as small as an invisible speck of dust, and inside it thousands of complex structures. It repairs itself. It reproduces itself. Every second, the body manufactures 25 million new cells. Otherwise, as children, we'd become very old and soon we'd be a pile of dust. Do you get it, my friends? This wonderful, magnificent temple keeps making new cells to keep us alive. And the food we eat and the oxygen we breathe in, it turns into electricity. You know, there are four great forces. Physics talks about them. Gravity and thermodynamics, thermonuclear, strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force. The power of gravity, if its ratio to the weak nuclear force was greater than one part of a trillionth of a trillionth, there'd be no universe. Did you know the expansion rate of the universe is one every billion billion times? There are 15 constants that physics tells us about. And some of them, if they differed by one millionth, we wouldn't be here. Some of them, if they differed by one millionth of a millionth, we wouldn't be here. So, my friends, we live in a magnificent temple and we should care for it. We should eat and drink to the glory of God. Shouldn't spend all day inside. Get out and exercise. This is so important. May I encourage you, God loves fools. That's my only hope. It says in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, God loves the evil and the ungrateful. So they're fools. I would have no hope. You would have no hope. But for that, he loves us. We should seek him to learn how to live, that we might glorify him and bless other people. When Wesley was in his early 80s, he says, I'm never fatigued. I can travel, I can walk, I can preach, I never get tired. How come? Well, he cared for his body. Very careful what he ate. Very careful about exercise. His friend, George Whitfield, a greater preacher than Wesley, but not so careful with his habits, died in his 50s. Dear friend, God loves you and me, though we are fools. Let's seek him for help to live aright. And I, in my 90th year, wish you wisdom and heaven's richest blessing. God bless you.